What if you could have invested in Tom Brady's stock as a rookie? Your investment would have been up over 4,000%. Now it's not what if, but who's next? Mojo is the all new sports stock market that lets you invest in your favorite athletes and cash in on your passion. Sign up right now on the Apple App Store to get your first stock free worth up to $10,000. Over 300 NFL players are listed on Mojo, so you can invest in rookies like Brees Hall, rising stars like Elijah Moore, comeback candidates like Saquon Barkley, and superstars like Patrick Mahomes. Go long to make money when an underrated diamond in the rough breaks out, or short an overrated rival and make money as he flops. Prices move with every play, every game, and every headline, and you can buy and sell instantly anytime, all year long, so the action never stops. Mojo is live in New Jersey now. Get Mojo in the App Store today and start turning playmakers into moneymakers. Must be 21 or older to use Mojo and located in New Jersey to make trades. Have a gambling problem? Help is available at 1-800-GAMBLER. Visit mojo.com for more info. Hey everyone, welcome to The Final Four is Not on the Schedule. I'm your host, Eric, alongside with expert analyst, Rod. Thanks for joining us on the best MSU basketball podcast featuring an in-depth recruiting, game matchup, and post-game analysis. We dive deep to give you the best tools to enjoy the Spartans and impress your friends and family. Hey everybody, it's Eric alongside Rod. We're here for our Big Ten Reset. So we had our initial predictions for the Big Ten, and we're going to just kind of go through now before we get into the rest of the Big Ten schedule, the last 18 games for most teams, although I think some teams still have only played one. Uh, they'll play 19. I know I was one of those teams that has to play 10 games in January to catch up to everybody else. Uh, so we're going to go through previous predictions and sort of where we think things are now that we've seen a little bit more. Because one of the struggles we had this summer was there's so many transfers, there's such huge turnover in these teams, much more than usual. It was hard to kind of get an idea for, get a handle on, you know, what these teams are going to be like. And I think we have a better idea now. Obviously, we got the Big Ten games coming up. And so we're going to start just by going through uh, current, the previous prediction. So, uh, Rod, we're going to go from 14 to 1, your pr- predictions, and then I'll do mine, and then we'll just kind of go through the team. So you started with uh, Nebraska, Minnesota, Northwestern, Maryland, Penn State, Rutgers, Wisconsin, Iowa, Purdue, University of Michigan, Illinois, Ohio State, Michigan State, and Indiana. And then I had Nebraska, Northwestern, Maryland, Minnesota, Penn State, Wisconsin, Rutgers, U of M, Iowa, Indiana, Purdue, Ohio State, Illinois, MSU. Uh, so why don't we go ahead and start, I guess, we'll just go from worst to best in your, on your list, Nebraska. Yeah, um, might have missed the boat there. I don't <laughs> think they're great, but I don't think they're going to finish last. Uh, they're currently six and six, which doesn't sound great, but they're also number <laughs> 83 in Ken Palm, which is not terrible. Yeah. Um, and, and I think we've pretty clearly seen a couple of indications that, and this is damning with faint praise. I know, but I'm going to go ahead and do it anyway. <laughs> this pretty clearly looks like Fred Hoiberg's best team. Um, and, and you could say that, for a couple of different reasons. One is how they have fared against good opposition. So they've actually beaten three high major teams so far this year, Florida state and granted Florida state is having an apocalyptically bad season, really bad. Um, But they beat them and they beat them handily. They beat them by 17 on neutral floor. They beat Boston college who was, a bad ACC program as well these days. But again, they blasted them. They beat them by 21. And then they beat Creighton by 10. Now, granted, Creighton has gone from a top 10 team to out of the top 25. I think they've lost six straight. There's some injury problems there. But Nebraska, I believe, was right in the beginning of that streak. So before everybody had maybe become convinced that Creighton wasn't as good as they thought they were. Um, So we'll we'll give that one some gravitas, but that was pretty impressive. 
Um, now, they followed that up with three straight losses. They lost at IU by 16. But then at home, they took Purdue to overtime and lost by three. And quite frankly, Nebraska should have won that game. Right. They had numerous opportunities offensively down the stretch of regulation to put that one away. And they just could not get a shot to drop. And then they, they lost a not so impressive 15 point defeat to Kansas state on a semi neutral floor site. So that one's not so good, but the, that three game winning streak, the performance against Purdue, I think has to have you feeling pretty good. If you're a Nebraska fan, the other thing that's changed is all of a sudden they can defend. Okay. They're 65th in the country in adjusted defense. Um, there's no one thing that they're great in other than this. They don't foul. So they're not putting people on the line. Um, the one thing that's probably unsustainable is teams are also shooting a truly awful percentage. Uh, they're only shooting less than 62% from the line against them. That'll probably change. But the fact that they're not putting people there to begin with really helps. Um, I don't know how much of that is is sustainable at the current level again because they're not defending the two or the three really really well um but you know so far look mid 60s is a great spot defensively offensively they've still got problems they still turn it over a lot they shoot the three miserably um you know this is not a great team but in revising things do i think they're the worst team in the big 10 no yeah. Not, not, not at all. And, and in part that's because some of the additions that they've made, particularly Sam Griesel, who's their, their six, seven point guard is, is proving to be a really solid addition. And, and he's made a difference. You know, some of the returnees, Derek Walker's been really good inside. Uh, CJ Wilcher's helped them in the backcourt, but, but Griesel has really solved to some extent, at least that perpetual problem Nebraska has had with guards who just play at 110 miles an hour are rarely under control. Um, he's giving them a six, seven too. So he's giving them a completely different kind of look and it's made them more competitive. So I think they're better. So a team that may be worse than we thought we're going to, is going to, is uh, Minnesota. And I think you had them 13th and I think, uh, you know, all the question marks you had about Minnesota have sort of come out to be negatives and that they are, truly struggling. They got run off the court at home by Mississippi state by 18. They were competitive for a little bit. Michigan came in and blew blew them out of, at home as well. Uh, 90 to 75. And, and I, you know, they weren't competitive against Purdue either losing by 20 in, in Lafayette, West Lafayette. Yeah, it's, it's not good. And some of it is, um, circumstance. So Jamison battle, who was really good last year, and is the one guy they had coming back. He was hurt to start the season. And he's back now, and he's playing, but he's not the same guy he was, at least not yet. And that's a big part of it. I do think this. I think if they can get some version of Jamison Battle, last year's Jamison Battle, this season, and that's entirely possible, uh, he's good enough that I can see him dragging them to a win or two that you wouldn't see coming. But Beyond that, it's it's tough sledding. I mean, offensively, they're really struggling, and this is the biggest difference. Last year, if you remember, they had that iron six. They had their five starters and one reserve who right, played right. like 99% of the minutes. And they were not great. They weren't a great shooting team. They weren't a great rebounding team. The one thing they did exceptionally well is they avoided turnovers. They ended up sixth in the country in turnover percentage. This year – Number 267. That's a big, big difference. It's not the only problem they've got, but it's a big negative turnaround from a year ago. And so that's the thing you really don't like. The other areas, you know, they still don't shoot it well. They're one of the worst free throw shooting teams in the country. They're sub 60% as a team. So that's not great. <laughs> um, and they get there a fair amount too. That's a sad thing. Uh, but it, it's just going to be tough with those turnover numbers, given that they don't make it up shooting wise defensively. There's some things 
that one thing that's normally a predictor of a pretty good defense, they're 57th against twos. Normally that would tell you, okay, this should be a pretty good defensive team, yet they're only number 157 overall. And part of the reason is um, they've been truly, truly awful as a defensive rebounding group. So teams are getting second chances against them, and, and they're cashing in. Um, that's been a big problem. They don't generate any turnovers, um, and they're middling against the three. So maybe there's some room for upside there. But I, look, it's, it's not a referendum, in my opinion, on the long term for Ben Johnson, because I think as opposed to last year, he's actually trying to build his thing. You know, he's got a he's got several freshmen and young, even sophomores in his playing rotation this year. Whereas last year. It was, you know, the mid-major all-stars, if you remember, the transfers right. he could right. have, uh, getting a late start, you know, hired in whatever it was, March or, or early April. Um, this is a, It's a little different this year, and so it doesn't look as coherent. Um, but I, I still think he's a guy that I would, I would put some faith in if I were a Minnesota fan, um, but it's going to take a while. Uh, next up is Northwestern. And that's you know, right now Northwestern, as we're recording this, they're tied for third in the Big Ten at 1-0, and they're going to be one of those teams that has to play a bunch of games in January and make up an extra game in January yeah. in the Big Ten. So, you know, obviously came into Michigan State, beat Michigan State 70-63 in East Lansing for their only uh, game in the Big Ten so far. And they've looked to be a competent team, which is, I think, losing uh, Nance and I um, uh, can't think of his other, the other guy's name, went to Duke. The big kid, yeah, Ryan, Ryan, something right there. Uh, but you know they've they've looked okay, and so I don't know. I mean, it gets better than we thought. I think probably. Look, they're they're eight and two. They're fifty sixth in Ken Palm. So if you translate that to what that normally means, now Ken Palm isn't officially used by the by the committee, but it, it's factored in there, and it's a good it's a good frame of reference. I haven't looked to see where they are in the net because, frankly, at this point in the season, the net is way worse than Ken Palm in terms of any correlation or reality. But um, 56th overall, you're, you're in the discussion. You're in the running. And, and look, they're, they're bad offensively. No two ways about it. They can't hit the broadside of a barn. They're number 229 from three. They're number 337 from two. And they're only number 103 in turnover percentage. So it's not like they're doing a great job in that area. They're just okay. They don't offensive rebound. So you look at this and say, how are these guys any good? Well, it's because they've got the number nine defense in the country. Yeah. They are they are number one in the country against twos. They're number 82 against threes, which is all right. They're number 38 in generating turnovers, which is a rare Northwestern. You don't think about that, but – they're, they're more aggressive in their half-court defense, occasionally trapping, that type of thing. They're, they're doing a pretty good job, even though they're more aggressive than we normally see, they're doing a pretty good job at avoiding fouling. And somehow, despite the fact that they don't really have a, a lot of playable size, they're number three in the country in block percentage. So that helps with the two-point defense for sure. Um I don't know. I mean, Northwestern, I obviously we have a bias because they came in, they beat Michigan state at Breslin, but you look at the, you look at the track record, you know, they haven't played a lot of big time opponents. They played Georgetown, which is a bad big East team. And they beat them by 12 at Georgetown. That's pretty good. They played Auburn extremely tough, lost by a single point on a neutral floor and dictated pace. They lost that game 43, 42. They beat Michigan state by seven. They played another Big East team in their last game, DePaul, and they beat them by 38. So, again, that's what you're supposed to do. You take a bad team and you blast them. Um, the one outlier is just the outright disaster at home against Pittsburgh in the Big Ten ACC Challenge where they lost by 29. And I watched that game. It was right before Michigan State. And I'll admit it impacted my view of Northwestern. I thought, well, you know, just when you start believing that maybe they figured a couple things out, they go out and just get destroyed by one of the worst power power six teams in the country on their own floor. It didn't bode well, but they've recovered. They've won three straight, including the MSU game. And 
look, if that defense can stay anywhere near where it's been to date, they're going to have a chance to be competitive. I'm not ready to say that I believe we vastly underestimated them, picking them what I pick them 12th. Yeah. Um, but there's a chance I did. Yeah. That defense, would, look, I think what it's going to come down to is two things. Can that defense stay anywhere close to where it's been? And can their guards get better? Because their guards have to carry them. They did in the game in East Lansing. You know, Audige and Bowie played well and Barry chipped in also, and that was enough. Those guys have to be on point. They've got to be even better than they've been thus far. But they got a chance. Yeah, I think I think the the big difference from our preseason is that they're a team that could probably get up and it's more likely they're gonna get up and bite you and, and beat you when if you're not playing well. And I think the possibility of them being twelfth or, you know, even like seventh, I think is not totally unreasonable, right? I think that's there's there's a lot of uh, variability in the league. A lot of variance. Yeah. That's one thing that has not changed. Our view of some of these teams directionally, like up or down, is is maybe a little bit different. But overall, it's it's similar yeah. in that there's room for a lot of variance. As we're recording this, their net is 62 for those interested. Uh, we'll go on to the next team you had. And this one, I'm sure you're going to feel differently about this, Maryland. You know... If we'd done this a week ago, <laughs> I would have been saying we missed the boat massively yeah. on Maryland. I was so impressed with what I saw from Maryland early. Maryland got some wins that are, are might surprise people by how significant they were. They played a St. Louis team that's pretty good and in the A-10 and beat them by 28 on a neutral floor, just blasted them. They handled Miami, who's a decent ACC team that I think, believe is in the top 25, for whatever that's worth, um, and is in a weak ACC, probably is a great shot to be a tournament team. Neutral floor beat them by 18. They blasted Louisville, which everybody's doing. That's no big deal. But then at home, they beat Illinois by five. Mm-hmm. So they're 8 no at that point. Or, yeah, 8-0 yeah, eight yeah, eight mm-hmm. at that point. You're feeling pretty good. They, they go to Wisconsin, lose by five. That's that's no shame. You know, Cole Center, tough loss. Really competitive in a slugfest against Tennessee on a neutral floor, and they lost by three. Again, I'm not going to ding them for that. That that game, they were, you know, they were competitive. But then UCLA at College Park, goes in and beats them by 27. And that one got my attention. Now, I've seen people suggest, well, that was the schedule caught up to them. Yeah. Eh, that wasn't – I looked at it. The, the travel, Yes, it was a number – they played basically four really competitive games in a row. But that was over the course of two weeks. Their schedule was set up no differently than a typical two weeks in the Big Ten. That's a Big Ten schedule. Yeah, right. That's not that big deal. And and the travel wasn't bad. I mean, they were home against Illinois. They went to the Central Time Zone to play Wisconsin. They were in New York, I believe, playing Tennessee. And then they were back at home playing UCLA. What's the big deal? Yeah. Um, So I don't buy that. I, I think what's happening is a little bit of coming back to earth. Their numbers still look good. You know, overall, they're 27th in offense, 37th in defense. But I, I think there's a problem of brewing. Their three-point percentage, they're number 251 in the country, 31.8%. And if you look at the guys they're asking to shoot a lot of them, they're not shooting well. Uh, Jameer Young, who's a transfer point guard and has played well overall for them, really struggling from three. I mean, really struggling. That's he's at twenty-seven percent. Dante Scott, who I saw earlier in the season and was really impressed, he lost twenty pounds. I've always been a fan of his, but he looked great to me. He's slowed down of late. He's down to under thirty-three percent from three. They need him to be better than that. Um, you know, I, their other starting guard, Donald Carey, twenty-four percent. It, it's going to be tough for them to be an upper, like a top four type Big Ten team if they can't do it better than that. 
Um, otherwise, I think their numbers still shape up pretty well. And look, I'm impressed with Kevin with what Kevin Willard has done in his first year, getting kind of a late start and pulling it together. They're competitive. They're very competitive. And I think at the very least, we have to say they're a team that's firmly in the tournament mix. But how much better they're going to be than 11th? I, I think it remains to be seen. It's possible, but it's also possible if that sh- if that jump shooting doesn't turn around, that it could be closer to what I said than I would have thought a week ago. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Their net is 35th right now. Uh, so number so then, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's pretty good, but you know, that can change obviously. Um, number yep. 10, Penn state and uh, Michigan state played Penn state and won in happy Valley. Uh, but, uh, you know, tough game, uh, and they're a team that, well, they're kind of a strange team, just kind of you, as as expected this season because they don't have much size, and yet they're sort of managing to be very competitive in a lot of games. Really competitive. Look, this is, I I think this is a team that you have to put in the tournament mix, which I wouldn't have said was impossible, but I would have thought was unlikely coming into the season. Uh, we talked about it when we went through the pregame and the postgame. I'm really impressed with what Micah Shrewsbury's done at Penn State. He has a flawed roster, and they're 33rd overall in Ken Palm, 25th in offense, 54th in defense. They're doing some things really, really well. They're number two in the country in turnover percentage. And you would hope you'd get something out of playing all those guards. Well, they're getting it. <laughs> they're also number three in the country in three point percentage, 41.5% as a team. That's, that's getting into, you know, Denzel Valentine, Bryn Forbes, senior year territory there. That's that kind of shooting. So really impressive. I, I don't know if they can keep it up at quite that level, but I wouldn't bet against them. They shoot free throws very well. They don't get there much, but they can them when they get there pretty good at twos as well. They're in the top 100. Um, the 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 issues offensively are they don't get to the line and they never get an offensive rebound. They're number three fifty nine out of three hundred sixty four <laughs> Division one teams in offensive That's rebound. So they we saw that. <laughs> yeah, they just abdicate. They don't even bother. But you know, again, what choice does he have? He's playing. I say four guards. Sometimes he's playing five. And you know, if you want to get down to it, really, and yet it's. He's he's managed to find a way with this team. I do not think this is what Micah Shrewsbury wants to do for the rest of his coaching career, but he's playing the hand he's dealt, and he's doing a hell of a job with it. Defensively, they're not great, but they're competitive. They're in the top 100 against twos. They're number 120 against threes. Not terrible. They're number 32 in defensive rebounding, so they're really doing the job there, and they don't foul all that much. So... You know they're not they're not going to go out and and absolutely lock people up, but they're competent. You know they're doing what they can do, and and I think we saw in the Michigan State game they're they're not a tall team, but there's a physicality to yeah, that team for sure that some taller teams don't have, and that plays defensively. That plays on the defensive boards. You look at the you look at the track record to date. You know, they lost their three losses were were all tough losses. They lost by two on a neutral floor to Virginia Tech. Definitely a game they could have won. They lost a double overtime at Clemson, game they could have won. They lost at home to Michigan State by nine, but that score flattered MSU a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, that's one I'm sure they'd like to have back. But then they went into Illinois, <laughs> blasted them at Champaign and blasted them by fifteen. That was really impressive. And then came back eight days later, just just yesterday, and played Canisius, kind of a letdown scenario, you would think. At home, they won by 30. So I think Penn State is for real in this sense. I think they are going to be a very tough team for anybody to beat. And um, I'm kind of grateful, even though it would be at Breslin, that Michigan State doesn't play them a second time. Yeah. Because I think they're capable of winning a game at Preslin. Uh, they are they are loaded with veterans. They have a leader in Pickett who is tough as nails and just a he's my I mentioned this in the Mike Garland episode. 
He's my favorite non-MSU player in the Big Ten this year. I just love the way that kid plays. He's always under control. He's playing the game at his pace. He's so unorthodox in the way he plays, and I just love watching that. I love watching smaller guys operating in the lane with their back to the basket, spraying the ball or, or posting people up. It's They're a lot of fun. They're a lot of fun to watch, and um, they're not going to be a lot of fun for opposing teams to face. Uh, so the next team is, or, and so Penn State was 41st in net, and the 40th in net is the next team, Rutgers. They're one and one in the Big Ten. They're seven and one overall. Uh, sorry, seven and three overall. Seven four, excuse me, seven four. The with again one and one in the Big Ten, and um, I don't know. I guess they kind of been what we expected, wouldn't you say? Yeah, but I feel like I feel like they're they're right teetering on the verge of maybe being better. <laughs> yeah, this is getting back to old school. By old school, I mean like three years ago, four <laughs> years ago, ancient history. <laughs> yeah, they're number one twenty eight in offense. They're not good. They don't shoot. They don't shoot well at all. They're number two eighty two from three. Number two hundred three from two. They're number two eighteen in turnover percentage. That's not good. The only thing they do well offensively, offensive rebounding. Number thirty. They're back to that. But defensively, they're number four in the country. They are shutting people down from three, sub 25% from three against them. Sometimes that number is a fluke. I don't think it's a fluke with this team. Yeah. Um, they are generating a ton of turnovers. They're number seven in the country in turnover percentage. They're, they're good against twos. They're number 44. Um, they generate a bunch of steals, which helps them offensively because it leads to you know some easy baskets where they kind of struggle to score in general. The only thing they don't do well defensively, ironically, is defensive rebounding. They're only number 206. <laughs> um, so if they get that cleaned up, look out. But, I, you know, I look at their profile. It's they, they lost a weird game to Temple by six early on. That's, that's a bad loss. They lost by seven to Miami of Florida away. Not embarrassing. Miami's a pretty good team. Um, disappointing, but still. Then they go in. At home in the rack, they blast Indiana by 15. Um, and then they had a couple very tough losses. They lost at Ohio State by a point in a game they very easily could have won. They lose by two at home to Seton Hall in a game they played very poorly and were really disappointed to lose because that's a rivalry game. But then they bounced back uh, this past Saturday and blasted Wake Forest um, by, uh, what was it, by 24. 24 points, yeah at home. So I don't know, man. I, I feel you know, Rutgers has some tools, some pieces that I like. And to be fair to them, I don't think they're kind of similar to Michigan state in that they've had some key guys in this case, two guards, uh, Caleb McConnell, who's the reigning defensive player of the year in the big 10 and Paul Mulcahy, who's their point guard and kind of their offensive fulcrum. Those guys have missed a fair amount of time. They're both back now, but they haven't had them for the whole season. So there's a part of me that feels as if they get those guys firmly back into the mix. Who knows? And we've seen Rutgers, particularly last year. Remember, we were, I want to say it was the end of January, maybe. And we were, I know I was declaring Rutgers dead. Right. <laughs> no chance yep. at an NCAA tournament bid. No shot. Well, I ended up with egg on my face in that one because they made it. And uh, so I look at the record and I think, well, right now, I mean, their, their Ken Palm is good. They're number 28. You said they're 40 mm -hmm. in the net that those are healthy numbers. So it's not as if they're not where they were last year, where they just had some miserable losses. Most of the losses they've taken have been reasonable. Um, it, but I think there could be another gear. We'll have to see. They're in the mix. They're clearly in the tournament mix. They're clearly in a top half of the Big Ten finish mix. Um, but we're, we're just going to have to wait on that offense. I think that's going to be what tells the tale. The obvious thing to say is someone has to win and someone has to lose these games. And so you have all these teams that are sort of close. I mean, you know, it kind of comes down to maybe luck or just who's playing well that night or what, who gets a shot to fall. Uh, so we'll go up to number eight, which is the top of the bottom which would be the Wisconsin Badgers and their profile. Uh, they are uh, 
having a pretty good season. I mean, I guess you could almost say that about all the teams in the Big Ten are much better outside of Minnesota than we thought they were going to be, or at least some better. Wisconsin's 2-0 in the Big Ten. Uh, they've, they're have they 44th in the net, and they are um, have a nice, healthy record at uh, nine and uh, nine and two. There, there's some things to really like about their profile. All right, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. They have played seven games against high major opposition. They're five and two. The two losses, they lost by one point to Kansas on a neutral site in overtime, and then they inexplicably lost a home game by three to Wake Forest, which is a weird one. But the wins, they beat Stanford by 10. They beat USC by five. They beat Marquette, who's having a very nice season, by three in overtime in a rivalry game. They beat Maryland by five at home. Then they went into Iowa City and beat Iowa by three in overtime. So there's some nice performances here. I would say it reminds me a little bit of their team last year. If you remember (laughs) last year, there were a lot of those close games that they managed to win. And you just kind of kept waiting for the correction to come. And it sort of did in the end, but um, they didn't get very far in the tournament. It, it's, it's an interesting team. You know, they're 86th offensively. So not great. Um, they shoot the three. Well, they're right around where MSU is 37.4% from three. Good for 53rd in the country as usual. Good. Um, uh, ball valuing team 14th and turnover percentage but everything else is kind of bad they struggle at the line they're terrible from two they're number 295 they don't offensive rebound which is standard for them and they don't get to the line a whole hell of a lot so offensively uh, i don't love them i mean they, they when i look at these guys individually i'm not very impressed you know tyler wall has made himself into a very good player but let's not kid ourselves. If Tyler Wall is your top guy, your top threat offensively, I don't know how good you can be on offense. Yeah, right. You know, I just don't. He doesn't shoot the jumper at all. Um, he's a clever finisher inside, but he's not athletic. I mean, they just there's only so much. Chucky Hepburn, he's okay. Doesn't doesn't make me do cartwheels. Stephen Kroll kind of a standard issue like average wisconsin big he can shoot from range a bit he's tall he's gumpy uh, you know but not not overly impressive they they don't have that johnny davis type which was unusual for them that they actually had last year an athletic guy who can can honestly make things happen on his own they don't have that the defense is impressive though they're 16th in the country there um not only mediocre against twos, they've been really good against threes thus far, really good defensive rebounding team. Unlike a lot of Wisconsin teams in the past, they actually do generate some turnovers. They're top 50 in steal percentage. That's not Bo Ryan basketball. Um, once again, though, like last year, free throw defense has been a big positive. Opponents are only shooting 65% at the line. They must stare at so them funny or maybe- something. <laughs> Maybe Greg Gard has figured something yeah. out. Maybe it's the equivalent to um, whatever whatever um, some of these countries like uh, Cuba have been doing and to, uh, to lead to foreign diplomats coming down with strange headaches. <laughs> they're, they're beaming <laughs> something at free throw shooters. I, I don't know. Some kind of technology they developed in Madison we're not aware of. But um, Bad you would in think that room. levels out. Yeah. Yeah. You would think that levels out, though, and that's not a positive for them. But look, the the wins are impressive, and even the losses, especially the Kansas loss, that's a that's the definition of a good loss. You know, Kansas, there are people trying to make the case for them being the best team in the country right now. I'm not sure I believe it, but they're good. They're very good. Um, yeah, it's a typical Wisconsin team. I mean, I think we had them. Where do we have them? Ninth, eighth, or eighth? eighth yeah. So just the yeah, top of the so bottom. I figured they would. I figured they would be a tournament team because I figured the Big Ten would get at least eight. Um, I still think that. I don't know where they're going to finish. I don't expect them to win it. But um, look, already with a road win in the bank against Iowa, that's that's good. That's a good. St- what if you could have invested in Tom Brady's stock as a rookie? Your investment would have been up over four thousand percent. Now it's not what if, but who's next? 
Mojo is the all new sports stock market that lets you invest in your favorite athletes and cash in on your passion. Sign up right now on the Apple App Store to get your first stock free worth up to $10,000. Over 300 NFL players are listed on Mojo, so you can invest in rookies like Brees Hall, rising stars like Elijah Moore, comeback candidates like Saquon Barkley, and superstars like Patrick Mahomes. Go long to make money when an underrated diamond in the rough breaks out, or short an overrated rival and make money as he flops. Prices move with every play, every game, and every headline, and you can buy and sell instantly anytime, all year long, so the action never stops. Mojo is live in New Jersey now. Get Mojo in the App Store today and start turning playmakers into moneymakers. Must be 21 or older to use Mojo and located in New Jersey to make trades. Have a gambling problem? Help is available at 1-800-GAMBLER. Visit mojo.com for more info. Start. No kidding. And well, that brings us to our next team, number seven pick, which is a net of 30 this season are the Iowa Hawkeyes at eight and three. Uh, they are, uh, they are, have kind of a strange year in that they've, Chris Murray has become, I think, what everyone expected him to be much improved and to be a replacement in some ways for Keegan Murray. Uh, they've had lost to TCU, which wasn't very good. They beat Clemson. They beat Seton Hall at Seton Hall. They played a very poor game against Duke, especially Chris. Uh, Chris Murray was very did poorly there, and then he they found that he was basically injured during that game, and so they lost by twelve there. So he has not played since. And then what was a real surprise to me is the, the rivalry game. Iowa State came into Carver Hawkeye and just got obliterated. They lost by almost twenty points uh, to a Chris Murray less team, and then they almost they really probably should have beaten Wisconsin. Uh, that game ended up in overtime. Um, but you know that's that was a depleting losing having your best player out of the game makes it really a struggle. Do you, do you have a sense? You follow Iowa more closely than mm-hmm. I do. Is there any expectation as to where Chris Murray's at? No, I've not seen anything except I think they expect him back by January. But um, he has sort of okay. an ambiguous kind of I, you know it's a little bit less. There's a little bit less news out of there and spe- specificity of the injury than I get from like the uh, from Michigan State. You know they. Izzo almost tells you too much, <laughs> whereas I think there's right. a little bit less out of Iowa. They just say, "Oh, he's you know progressing and he's he's doing well. He'll be back in a you know a couple of weeks or something." Yeah. Uh, so I I don't know. I mean, I guess the expectation is he's gonna be back in a couple of games. So he'll probably they've got Eastern Illinois and then they're at Nebraska on December 29th, and that's when they start that you know they have to play I think 10 or 11 games in like 30 days uh, as they try and catch up to the rest of the Big Ten. So I don't, I don't know. Yeah. I, mean, I, I think probably seventh is probably a good spot for them. I think they're going to win some games. They shouldn't, I think overall, I think about what I expected, I guess I would, is how I'd describe them. I think Chris Murray's a little better than I thought he'd be. And I think everyone else is eh, not quite as good. And I think they're, I think they're, you know, maybe Patrick Murray is going to, McCaffrey is going to be better and Connor McCaffrey. So I don't know. I, I think, look, Chris Murray's health is, a huge, huge, huge deal. They need him back. I mean, they, they got through the Iowa State game on adrenaline, rivalry game, et cetera. Well, then you lose it. And I understand they should have won the game, but you lose at home against Wisconsin. That's not good. They came back and blasted Southeast Missouri State, but big deal. I mean, the team. rubber's going to hit yeah. the road when they're back in the Big Ten. You know, offensively, they've been Iowa. They're eighth. Really good job taking care of the ball. They've shot well from two not great from three 139th but okay decent enough they're getting the line a decent amount and they're okay there decent offensive rebounding number 65 the, the thing that's maybe a little bit surprising is they're not abjectly horrible defensively thus far they're 74th overall and the, the only thing i guess would worry me is that's being driven in part by three point percentage defense. They're 47th in the country. That's a number that could slip. Um, But still, if they can, if they can stay anywhere near, if they could stay in the top 100 defensively, to be honest, um, I think that gives them certainly makes them an NCAA tournament caliber team. But again, the, the upside here is very clearly Chris Murray dependent. No question. If he's back and he's what he was early on, they've got a go-to guy. If he's not, they don't have a go-to guy. 
they've got some good players. Tony Perkins, Patrick McCaffrey, Robracha looks better to me this yep. year. Um, but they, they don't have a go-to guy. And then it's, you know, when you're an offensively oriented team that doesn't have a go-to guy, I'm not sure where that leaves you. Yep. I, I totally agree with that assessment. So we'll go to number six, uh, the team that is uh, 2-0 in the Big Ten. Their net ranking is three, and that's the Purdue Boilermakers. Uh, you know, I I think the six is probably going to be – I'd, I'd be hard-pressed for them to end up six, barring, you know, an injury, a key injury in that team right now. I think they're going to be a top-four team in the league. Well, I, I will say this right now, and Ken, if you use Ken Palm, the, you know, there are projections as of the moment as to what would happen – in all the remaining games and Ken Palm <laughs> game by game. This is where it gets, you have to think about it. They are favored right now to win every single game on their schedule, but the percentage confidence in that is v- varies from game to game. So the actual projected record is 25 and six, 14 and six in the big 10 despite the fact that looking at it, they got a W <laughs> next to every game. Yeah, you know, some of them are like, there's a, they're predicted to win the game at Ohio state by a point. Yeah. So yeah. it's only a 51% chance that they win. According to Ken Palm, you, you get the point. Um, I, we, we talked about them in our, our ask me anything. Um, I think that they're a very good team. They're better than I expected them to be in large. Well, two reasons. One, they're back to playing. This is the big thing, and this is the sustainable thing, perhaps. They are back to playing typical Matt Painter defense after a weird outlier season last year where they couldn't guard anybody. The number 24 overall in defense. They're really great against the three so far. They're solid against the two. They're rebounding the ball defensively. They're not fouling people. I mean, it's all good stuff. I question their guards in the big 10. I think there are going to be times that we see their inexperience and lack of top end athletic ability show up. I don't know how much it'll show up. I don't know what they might be able to do to mitigate that, but that would be the worry I would have if I were Purdue. And then the second thing related to that is what point do those freshman guards hit the wall? How long does that last? And do they have an answer for it? Do they have ways that they can supplement the production they might not get from those guys whenever they're going to that. Cause it's inevitable. Freshmen do not go through the big 10 without hitting a patch where they struggle and both of their starting guards are freshmen. So you would expect that will be an issue. Um, the other thing is, you know, it's a big strength that you've got the guy who seems to be everybody's favorite for national player of the year right now. in Zach Eady. but <clears throat> Unlike some other years, I think you would have to wonder what might happen to Purdue if he got hurt. Mm -hmm. They've typically had another answer there, right? And they might have one. They might be able to get by with playing Caleb first at center and playing Gillis and Kaufman ran a little more at the four, and they they might be okay. But um, okay is different from what they are right now. And so, and, and I only say this because look, it's a, it's not a crazy thought that big kids, especially giant, giant, giant kids like Edie can be vulnerable to getting hurt. You know, yeah. it just takes one weird possession, one weird play. Um, but they're, they're the favorites. They've, I, I don't know if I don't expect them to run away with the big 10 this year, despite how good they've looked, but have they earned the right to be considered the favorites? Clearly. So the next team uh, is uh, the number five is seven three in overall one and zero in the Big Ten. They are eighty six in net, and that would be the Michigan Wolverines. I think that's actually the second worst net rating in the Big Ten, I believe. Yeah, uh, four. They're better in Ken Palm. They're forty ninth, um, but yeah, they're they're taking a beating in the net. Yeah, we overrated them. Um, you know, offensively they're okay. They're 24th. And that's in large part due to the fact that they are number one in the country in turnover percentage, which I would not have predicted. They don't shoot it great. You know, they're 35.7% from three, which is good for 94th in the country. It's okay. 
They're number 102 in twos. They're a terrible free throw shooting team, 66%. That's something that could come back to bite them. They don't offensive rebound. They're number 317 in offensive rebound. I mean, Juwan Howard's got to be beside. That's just not, that's not what you expect from a team coach by Juwan Howard. But, um, you know, again, the turnovers are really helping there, that they're just not committing them. But the defense is a problem. They're 91st. Um, they don't guard against the three. They don't guard against the two. They're not a particularly good defensive rebounding team. I mean, that was the thing about John Beeline teams. They had never offensive rebound, but boy, they were good on the defensive glass. Mm-hmm. This team isn't great in either. They're terrible on offense and they're mediocre on defense. Um, not a lot of positives for this team on defense. And, and frankly, I even the offensive rating looks pretty good, but there, there are reasons to worry there. You know, they they tried to solve their point guard problem by bringing in Jaden Llewellyn, the kid from Princeton. And I said in the preseason, from what I understand, he's not a point guard. I don't know what they're thinking. That led to Frankie Collins, who was a point guard and who looked pretty good late last year to transfer. So they lost a guy who could have been an answer in favor of a guy who I didn't think was going to be an answer. And he wasn't the answer. And then he got hurt and he's done for the year. So what are they left with? They're left with a freshman, Doug McDaniel, who has some, has some potential. He's extremely quick. He's got some uh, pizzazz to him. He's got some balls to the way he plays, which you like in a point guard. But he's a truly terrible defensive player at this point. He doesn't have any understanding of what he's doing. And offensively, he's a very questionable shooter. And I don't know that I expect him to hold up. So then you're left with having to play Kobe Bufkin a lot on the ball. Either way, whether you're starting McDaniel or not. And Bufkin, to his credit, has really turned it around in their last few games. He started to find his shot. And I've always been a Kobe Bufkin fan. I I thought he'd be a great player when they signed him. He really struggled last year. He struggled early this year, but he started to find himself. Here's my question, though. Kobe Bufkin is best, in my opinion, off the ball. He's best as a guy who can hunt shots, who can run stuff for off the ball, you know, get him moving off picks, get open jumpers. That's where you want him playing. If you've got to use him on the ball a ton, one, I don't think that's his natural position, so I don't know how much help you're getting there, although they made out of a choice. And two, you're taking him away from some of the things that he does best. So you might be losing in two areas. Uh, it remains to be seen. Um, thus far, He's, he's played well. The team has not played well. You know, they blasted Minnesota, but, you know, come on. And, <laughs> and they really struggled to beat the mighty Lipscomb uh, team at home the other day. They've got a, a big test coming up against Carolina um, in a couple of days. And that will be the last opportunity they have for a notable non-conference win. Their, their, their games against you know, competitive teams, they got blasted by Arizona state and then they lost narrowly to Virginia by two and Kentucky by four, but their losses, Yeah, they don't have any wins that are comparable that level. So I, I think we, we had them fifth uh, right now. I would probably have them in the nine, 10 range. I mean, we've talked about, them. I'm not sure there's any team we've talked about from say 11 on up that I don't feel better about than Michigan right now. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying they'll finish 11th. They could find, you know, the, the thing they do have in their favor, they've got two legitimate offensive weapons, Dickinson and Jet Howard, yep. who on their day are guys that you might not be able to do much with defensively. But boy, that defense is bad. I mean, they are bad everywhere across the board they're awful jet can't guard anybody dickinson's horrible i said mcdaniel can't guard buffkin's not great they they just there's no strength and i think that's going to be a problem for them and the point guard thing could be a real problem we'll just have to see so number four are the alana from illinois they are 
eight and three overall, zero oh and two in the Big Ten with that surprising loss to Penn State we referred to in the last episode, um, or actually this episode. Uh, and they are a team that has had some really big wins, and that's why their net ranking is pretty high. But they've had some head scratchers, I guess is the way to put it. And you know, maybe this is sort of. I know I've got a friend who's a big Illini fan. He's like, well, you know, they're sort of figuring things out and stuff. But I don't know. I mean, I guess there's there's some stuff they got to figure out. <laughs> Are they in year year five or six of Brad Underwood figuring things out? Well, it's a new it's a new lineup, right? I mean, it's like a totally new team, and I think that's part of what he was Who's describing. Fault is that? Well. I'm not saying it's not anyone's yeah. fault. I'm just saying that's that's the explanation for yeah. they're figuring things out. That, that's true. But I feel that's been every year <laughs> <laughs> to one degree or another. I, I just I'm not a Brad Underwood fan as a coach. I don't think here's what I think. I think they've got a lot of talent, but I think they've had a lot of talent. I don't when I watch Illinois, I don't often feel that there's a coherency to how they're playing. I don't feel that Brad Underwood understands how to get the best out of his team. I'll give you a couple examples of what I mean. I'll go back to last year. They had things humming when Andre Corbello, my whipping boy last season (laughs) around the big 10 was hurt and they had no choice, but to play Trent Frazier on the ball. And they looked mostly great during that period. Trent Frazier was as mentally tough as anybody in the Big Ten. Great decisions. The team was humming offensively. And then Curbelo came back from his weird concussion, depression, whatever the hell was going on. And they insisted on inserting him back into a major role. And it made them worse. It was obvious to me. Wasn't obvious to Brad Underwood, apparently, because he kept doing it. (laughs) And they had a, you know, they didn't go anywhere in the end. They, they didn't, they didn't, uh, they won their big 10 title. Congrats. Um, but then, you know, nothing in March and flamed out the big 10 tournament too. And he just, at every turn, Brad Underwood says some stupid, he says stuff that I, I, I read from the outside looking in, I read as a guy chest thumping to cover up very obvious insecurities about his program. That's how I read him. And their performance on the court does very little to convince me that I'm wrong about that. I will then turn to this year's team. They are playing Penn state at home. Illinois has a bunch of size. They are playing Penn state, a team we've already talked about that has no size. How would you choose to attack that team? <laughs> Gee, I don't I know. Maybe you. go inside. <laughs> what did Illinois do? Jack threes, take terrible shots all game long, refuse to use their big men. It was unbelievable. They got exactly what they deserved in that game. They deserved an ass whipping, and that's what they got at home to a team that physically should have no chance. I've said, you know, The thing that concerns me about Penn State is they've got a very obvious manifest flaw on their roster. And in the Big Ten with so many capable bigs, I'm not sure how they'll hold up. But I'll tell you what, if other teams do what Brad Underwood's Illinois fighting a line I did, they might just survive and thrive. So I'm not in on Illinois. There's a lot of talent. You said they've got some big wins. They handled UCLA by nine. Big comeback. That was impressive. They beat Texas on a neutral floor by seven. That was impressive. But they lost to Virginia by nine. Not embarrassing, but whatever. You lose. You lose to Maryland away by five. Again, not embarrassing. But the Penn State loss really was an eye-opener to me. Uh, The talent level is very clearly present. I do not question that. You know, What I questioned at at the start of the season was, how is it blended? I questioned that, and I also questioned the youth of their backcourt. I don't see a lot of reason to change that assessment thus far. Uh, Young guards, where are the problems? Well, they're number 283 in turnover percentage. Not a good sign. Three-point percentage, they're number 135 as a team. Not a great sign. 
there are things they do well. They're a good offensive rebounding team. Again, they shoot twos extremely well. Defensively, they're pretty together. Um, minor problem, defensive rebounding isn't great. Three-point defense hasn't been great, but two-point defense has been. Uh, they generate turnovers, so they're active there. So they do some good things defensively. But I, I think it's I think it's three things. I think it's the youth of their backcourt. I don't trust it. Um, and unlike Purdue's young guards, Illinois' young guards have the physical tools, but they're not as together mentally as Purdue's guards are, from what I've seen. Um, the second thing is, can they find some coherency with all the pieces? I we're we're almost in January, and I don't think they've figured out a rotation. I don't think they've figured out playing groups. I don't think they've figured out who's best in what situations. I think that's all still to be determined. And sometimes you could figure it out. And you know, Michigan State's gone through years like that, so fair enough. But they got to do it. And then the third thing is Brad Underwood. I have zero faith in Brad Underwood as a guy who can elevate them to where their fans think they should be. Their fans think they should be a nationally relevant program. You know, a program that's competing for Final Fours is seen as a national title contender. And I need to see Brad Underwood do one (laughs) smart thing before I believe that. I haven't seen it yet. Over however many years he's been there, I haven't seen it. So I will, co- I'll continue to beat that drum until he proves me wrong. <laughs> yeah, we'll go into number three of the Ohio State Buckeyes. Ohio State is uh, seven and three overall, one and zero in the Big Ten. They had some pretty big. Uh, let's see, they had some good wins in Maui. I think they beat Cincinnati. They beat Texas Tech. They lost to San Diego State, and they lost to Duke in the ACC Big Ten Challenge. Their one win was against Rutgers by a point, which at home, which. That was we didn't even talk about that, but that was a game that Rutgers really should have won, and there was a bad call that actually yep. the shot that went up shouldn't yep. have happened. But anyway, they lost uh, then overtime to, at North Carolina, which I think was a pretty good a pretty good loss. It, you know, even though it was a loss, it was a competitive game. I, look, I, I Ohio State's about what I thought they'd be overall. They're really good on offense. They're number four in the country right now on offense. Um, they're great. They're just attacking the offensive glass. They're number 10 in offensive rebounding. Solid three-point shooting team, solid from two, solid at the line. They don't get there a ton, but when they do, they cash in. Um, turnover percentage is not great. That's a young backcourt, but number 102, it's not a disaster. Um, it's it's defense again, which I, I, I got to tell you, I don't understand it because Chris Holtman at Butler, I think, was – pretty good defensively and his first year or two in Columbus was pretty good but this is like the third year running that they've really had a problem they're number 77 defensively which isn't the end of the world but it's not good and they're not going to win a Big Ten title this way I can tell you that much Um, their defense against twos is really not good Um, they're not doing a great job as a defensive rebounding group either and they're fouling, eh, they're not terrible, but they're not they're not great there in avoiding fouling. So there's some issues to work out. Ohio State's got to get better defensively because the young guards are what they are. They're young. And so they're gonna make mistakes. You know, they're they're good, they're a very talented group. Um, so they'll do they'll continue to do so. I mean, Bryce Senzabaugh is kind of a guard, he's more of a power wing, is having a crazy good freshman season. Zed Key's been good. Justice Suing's been good. They've got mm-hmm. players, and they've got some decent depth. They they do some things nicely, but you know I'm feeling like three to five, three to six is feeling about right. Yeah. And the only thing that's going to change is if they get better checking people. Yeah, I think at this point, three years in a row, you got to say this is probably just who they are now. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I guess. It... Yeah, yeah, because it's different players and it had same yeah. results. Uh, moving on then to number two, you had Michigan State. Their net ranking is 61, which I think people, probably people are a little surprised that that's low. Uh, but, you know. Yeah, but it's it's improving. They were way yeah, lower. Yeah, they were lower. That, it, it, actually, it is actually one of the lowest in the Big Ten, which just shows you how strong the Big Ten is this season. Um, you know, Michigan State's coming. And how weird and how weird. Well, yeah, is right. At this point. Of Michigan State's 7-4, one and one of the Big Ten, as everyone knows, as we're recording this right now. So, you know, I don't. I think – 
they've not full strength. And, you know, I don't think we really know what this team is until mid to late January, really, once Malik Hall's back to full, fully operational and Aikens as well. Look, I mean, we don't have to belabor it. People kind of know where we're at. Yeah. Um, the, the two things that are really impressive, the turnover percentage is the best it's ever been by a mile under Tom Izzo. Defensive rebounding is back to Michigan State levels. Offensive rebounding is horrible. Um, they're shooting free throws exceptionally well, but they're not getting to the line enough, not even close to enough. They're shooting threes reasonably well. They are not shooting twos well at all. Um, defensively, they're solid, if unspectacular. Um, but as you say, the bottom line is let's get everybody healthy and then see what you've got. Cause we really haven't had that yet. Yep. Uh, so then finally, number one, and what is the greatest line? I think if final four is on the schedule this season is your prediction that Indiana would be, is your number one team, but you don't predict that Indiana will win the big 10, which I thought was hilarious, but totally appropriate at the time, right? Like, ah, I don't think it's going to be Indiana's. I guess the front runner, but I don't really believe in them. And boy, they have given you every reason to, to believe that that's totally accurate. I couldn't pick them. I mean, I, I had to pick them. There was nobody else who made any sense as you went through it because everybody was so flawed, but I just, in my gut, I just thought this team's not winning and boy, it's, that's looking solid. You know, uh, for some reason, Indiana fans got really excited about a 12 point home court win over North Carolina in the big 10 ACC challenge. And I get it. It's North Carolina in front of the jerseys. They're coming off a national title game appearance, but let's be honest, North Carolina, they're hoping they turn the corner with this Ohio state win the other day, but they've been bad. They fell off. They started the season. Number one, they fell all the way out of the top 25. So I'm not sure how much that really meant. And sure enough, Indiana in their subsequent four games, they lost to Rutgers away by 15. They beat Nebraska at home by 16, but then lost to Arizona on a neutral floor by 14 and lost to Kansas away by 22. So three of those, the three games they lost, none of them were competitive. And now they've got Xavier Johnson, their point guard out for a while to be determined. Um, I am not sold on Indiana at all. They're a tournament team, but that's as far as I'll go. You know, the numbers look okay, but I, I, their guard play is a problem. It's been a problem. It remains a problem. The best thing you could say is maybe somehow, and I don't hold out a lot of hope for this, but maybe Xavier Johnson's injury opens the door. You know, they have their freshman, uh, Hood Shafino, who's just come back from an injury. I'm not convinced he's actually a point guard, but I'm also not convinced he's not a better option than Xavier Johnson was. Because I've seen him, Xavier Johnson is the epitome the last couple of years, the best example of an empty stats guy. You look at his numbers and you can convince yourself pretty quickly, oh, this guy's good. Not great, but he's good. And then you watch him play and you see what he does in key moments. You see what he does in a spot where you need a guy to make the right pass, take a good shot, and he never, ever does that. So uh, there's a chance that this is actually a silver lining sort of thing. I'm not betting on that, but there's a chance. Um, you know, it's the same old with this team. Trace Jackson Davis and Race Thompson are great. They don't get the ball nearly enough. Who's that on? Their guards. You know, they, ne they never play to their strength as much as they should. Um their numbers shooting the ball are better than they've been in recent years, but I don't have a lot of faith that's going to hold up. It's flawed. It's just something's wrong in Bloomington. And they keep changing. They reshuffle the, the chairs on the deck of the SS Bloomington, and it never gets better. I, I My impression watching them is very similar to, you know, our, my impression watching Nebraska. They just seem kind of random. I just I don't feel like right. there's any what sort are, of who like. Who are they? That I, I guess, you know, you've watched all kinds of teams and there just seems to be some sort of like, I don't know, theme or some sort of like a uh, plan of attack. And they just, they, it, I, I don't know. It's just kind of like a bunch of guys just playing basketball and they just are not like in sync. I don't know. It's, it's very strange. I can't describe it except hundred percent, hundred percent. If it, you know, if you look at that team, there's a pretty obvious answer in my opinion to what they should be. They should be a team 
that gets the ball to their big men a lot and plays through them. Let's gets the ball to those guys on the blocks and let them operate. Let them score in the post. Let them kick out for open shots, force defenses to collapse and deal with them. It's pretty obvious. When you watch them play, does that look like what their orientation is? Do, do they look like they have that plan? No. And this is the same. Trace Jackson Davis is going to have some really impressive career numbers, but my opinion is his career has largely been wasted. I'm, I, I can't pretend to know what's in his head and what he valued or, or any of those things, but in my opinion, he made a bad decision. And that's easy for me to say as a Michigan State fan, Michigan State was the other main school in his recruitment. But he is a very talented kid who, in my opinion, never got used the way he should have, yeah. at least not to this point. Sure. And it is continuing this year, despite the fact he's got good numbers, they're not as good as they should be. We, we ta- I know we've talked about this the last couple of years. You look at Trace Jackson Davis's field goal attempts, and you say, he should be taking five, six shots more a game, at least. He doesn't get the ball. When you watch them play, it's it's not like you know a kid like Robbie Baran at Northwestern that I say that about every year, but he seems to run away from shots. <laughs> Trace Jackson Davis doesn't get the ball enough. Yeah. So I, yeah, they're not winning it. Yeah, well, I know that much. I had them fifth, and because I I felt like they were the hype was largely a result of their kind of surprising Big Ten tournament run at the end of the season. Which yeah. was like, you know, they were playing awful like they usually did. And then they had that amazing second half against Michigan. They kind of just took that and carried that through to the semifinals, I well, think, where they sort of flamed and out. They, and look, they it was that, but it was also they had a lot of guys coming back. Yeah, and people sure. always assume that means they're going to get better. They added two McDonald's All-Americans. There were reasons on paper to buy it. But, you know, we both got – you were – uh, probably had better conviction than I did um, in picking them where you did because I, I kind of felt that way, but I just couldn't bring myself to pick anybody else, to put anybody else at number one, even though I didn't believe they'd win it. But yeah, they, they've got a lot to prove. I mean, Indiana is suspect with a capital S until proven otherwise. Well, we'll uh, wrap it up there. And uh, our next show will probably be against, it will be the Brown, pre- uh, sorry, the Buffalo pregame. And so until next time, the final force on the schedule, go green. What if you could have invested in Tom Brady's stock as a rookie? Your investment would have been up over 4,000%. Now it's not what if, but who's next? Mojo is the all new sports stock market that lets you invest in your favorite athletes and cash in on your passion. Sign up right now in the Apple App Store to get your first stock free worth up to $10,000. Over 300 NFL players are listed on Mojo, so you can invest in rookies like Brees Hall, rising stars like Elijah Moore, comeback candidates like Saquon Barkley, and superstars like Patrick Mahomes. Go long to make money when an underrated diamond in the rough breaks out, or short an overrated rival and make money as he flops. Prices move with every play, every game, and every headline, and you can buy and sell instantly anytime, all year long, so the action never stops. Mojo is live in New Jersey now. Get Mojo in the App Store today and start turning playmakers into moneymakers. Must be 21 or older to use Mojo and located in New Jersey to make trades. Have a gambling problem? Help is available at 1-800-GAMBLER. Visit mojo.com for more info.